to submit ourselves to one another in that we are servants. And so there's a design that God has for the home. And uh, man cannot improve on that. The world thinks they have a better idea. Well, how's that working out? What a mess we're in in our society. It's because we've gotten away from the Word of God. And God instituted marriage and family, and there's no better uh, design than what the Maker himself gave it. And so we need to honor that and follow that. But we're going to a very familiar passage for Mother's Day, and that would be Proverbs 31. If you turn there, please, Proverbs chapter 31. Probably the most common passage to preach on Mother's Day. Uh, I, I looked at the records and found it's been seven years since I preached on this passage. And so most of you weren't here seven years ago. And if you were, you don't remember the message anyway. So uh, I never preach the same passage exactly the same way twice. I always study it fresh and, and try to... Um, even when I reuse an outline, I still study it fresh and try to uh, let the Lord work in my heart about it. And uh, Proverbs 31 is very familiar, and we're going to look at especially verses uh, 10 through 31 uh, this morning. But I'm going to start off uh, with something you don't commonly hear about the passage. Um, the book of Proverbs is one of Israel's wisdom books. And it has prophetic significance for the Jews living in the tribulation period. Now, I'm not going to stop and try to prove that this morning because that's not my message. But there's a lot in Proverbs that applies to the coming tribulation. You know, they're going to need God's wisdom to faithfully endure to the end. They absolutely have to have the wisdom of God to do that. What a lot of people don't realize is Proverbs has prophecy in it. For an example, in Proverbs 30, verse 1, the words of Agur, the son of uh, Jacob, even the prophecy. The man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Eucal, and so on and so forth, but the prophecy. And then even here in Proverbs 31, verse 1, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy. Uh, that his mother taught him. We look at like Psalms and Proverbs and we find a lot of application and that's good. But understand this, it's still Israel's poetry and wisdom books and there's a lot of prophecy in Psalms and Proverbs. A lot of people uh, overlook. But Solomon, who was an expert on women, uh, since he had a thousand of his own, uh, he... Uh, he, I, he must have been an expert to have a thousand different women, but he has a lot to say in Proverbs about the strange woman. And he ought to know a lot about that because he, uh, most of the women he had were strange women. Uh, ten times in Proverbs we find reference to this. And one thing about the strange woman, and I'm not going to give you all the characteristics, but one of the main things is they are idolatrous. Go ahead and hold a marker here. Flip back to 1 Kings. chapter. I'm going to do this briefly uh, for those of you who think, man, you know, I'm not a mother, and uh, why, I don't need a Mother's Day message. Well, let me give you a little Bible study for a couple minutes, then we'll get back to mothers, okay? 1 Kings chapter 10, uh, and uh, just something interesting here to think about. In 1 Kings 10 about Solomon, in, or excuse me, chapter 11, 1 Kings 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. You know, he says a lot to his son in Proverbs about staying away from these kind of women, but uh, sadly he was hypocritical. And maybe he made those comments in Proverbs before he went this direction, I don't know. But Solomon himself failed greatly in this area. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zidonians, and the Hittites. So different cultures and uh, of different creed and, and, and race and whatever. But the main thing is we're going to read through here has to do with idolatry. It says, Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princess, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect 
with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination, talking about idols, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. By the way, this passage defines the word perfect in the King James Bible. The word perfect does not mean sinlessly perfect necessarily. It means complete and entire or fully because it talked about David having a perfect heart and yet David was not sinless. We all know that. But it said David's heart was perfect in verse 4 and then in verse 6 it says that he uh, went fully. It, Solomon, it says Solomon didn't go after the word fully uh, as did David his father. So that helps you understand that word perfect. Verse 7, then did Solomon build in high place for Chemosh, again idols, the abomination of Moab and the hill that is before Jerusalem and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrifice unto other gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel which had appeared on him twice. And had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. So strange women then especially has to do with idolatry. Now, I, I believe there is a prophetic picture uh, in Proverbs contrasting the strange woman and the virtuous woman. Now, for a description, and we won't turn over there for time, uh, again, the strange woman is referred to ten times. But for a real description of the strange woman, you go to Proverbs 7. And then for the description of the virtuous woman, you go to Proverbs 31. And what you have is the strange woman is a picture of the great whore Babylon that we read about in the book of Revelation. Uh, that is the mother of harlots. Babylon is the fountainhead of all idolatry. That's where all idolatry began with Babylon. And Babylon will be glorious once again. Literally Babylon now. The city Babylon will be what the book of Revelation describes in the tribulation period. You read in Revelation especially 17 and 18. Look in Proverbs 2. I'm almost done with this part, but I just can't help but to say a little bit about it. A little Bible study. Never heard anybody on a Sunday morning service. Proverbs chapter 2. And notice in verse 10. It says in Proverbs 2.10, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from the way of, of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things. And especially that applies to the Antichrist, who's to come. Who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. Who rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. Whose ways are crooked and they froward in their paths. To deliver thee from the strange woman. Even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Now that comes up a lot in Proverbs. The strange woman flatters and seeks to deceive, to lure away. And that's one of the marks of a false teacher, by the way, flattering words. The marks of a Bible preacher is plain words. you got to watch the smooth talkers. The smooth talkers are usually deceivers. Okay, and The Bible's clear on that. And it says, The strange woman flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. She's an apostate. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. And those that take the mark of the beast in the coming tribulation period uh, will suffer eternity in the lake of fire. The Bible's clear on that. Of course, that's got nothing to do with us because we who are saved, we're going to be raptured out before the tribulation even comes. But it says, verse 19, None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the paths of life, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men and keep the paths of the righteous. For the upright shall dwell in the land. That's talking about the land of Israel. And the perfect shall remain in it. But the wicked shall be cut off from the earth. And the transgressors shall be rooted out of it. And so there's a lot in Proverbs about this. Now, the strange woman, again, is a picture of um, Babylon, but the virtuous woman, who would that then be? Well, in Revelation, there's not only a harlot that's presented, 
there is a pure virgin bride. The virtuous woman is the godly remnant of Israel. And you read in Revelation about how she hath made herself ready through fine linen, which is the righteousness of saints. And you can't miss it when you study it that it's got to do with the nation Israel and that godly remnant uh, that will get the kingdom. And so it's just interesting to contrast that. Now you can also, not only prophetic, but see the Bible has different ways to, 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 for it to be applied. Now all scripture has one right interpretation. Some people say, well, that's, that's your interpretation. There are many interpretations. Where there may be many interpretations, but they're all wrong. The right interpretation is the one God gives in his word. The Bible interprets itself. There's only one right interpretation, but there are many different applications. And so you have the prophetic application but you know what? Uh, practically, it's a wise man who finds a virtuous woman instead of a strange woman. Uh, a, a man that marries a strange woman, she's an, uh, she is a heathen, so to speak. Uh, one of the things it says about a strange woman, she wears the attire of a harlot. Uh, and, and by the way, the way women dress is just, it's just an indicator of their heart's condition. A woman, a woman that dresses wrong outwardly has a wrong heart inwardly. And there's different things it says about a, a, a strange woman. Stay away from those kind of women and look for a virtuous woman. You ought to study, if you're a, if you're a young man, you ought to study what God says about these different types of women. And you, you, you ought to, that ought to narrow down the playing field, as they say, uh, because unfortunately there's not a whole lot of virtuous women out there. But that's what you ought to be looking for and praying for. I remember a, a preacher telling me, an older preacher, that in his church that they had a code the young men would use, they, P7 and P31. They'd say, now, watch out for her. She's P7. <laughs> but now she's, a, she's P31. And that was kind of the code they had between, uh, you know, which girls to stay away from and which ones were okay uh, to talk to. But back in Proverbs 31, Proverbs 31. Now, it's acrostic. This is a beautiful passage. Just reading Proverbs 31. It's just a beautiful passage, but it, it is also poetic. Again, this is a poetical book. And you may not know this, and you probably don't, because if you're like me, you don't know any Hebrew. But I've been told that in the Hebrew that there's an acrostic layout here. That there are 22, from verse 10 all the way down to verse 31, there are 22 sentences and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And in Hebrew, each sentence in this passage starts with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's kind of like Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, which is all about the Word of God. There are 22 sections, and each section... Uh, the, the verses in those sections start with the different letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And by the way, if you want to know what the Hebrew alphabet is, you go to Psalm 119 in your King James Bible, and above each of those 22 sections is the Hebrew letters. But not only Psalm 119, but even the book of Lamentations has an acrostic layout. But there is a structure here. You'll notice in verses 10 through 12 that we call this double alternation. And try to follow this. You have first alluded to about the virtuous woman, her husband. That's verses 10 through 12. And then it begins again in verse 23, referring to her husband. Next, her work is spoken of in verses 13 and 19. And then it's spoken of again in verse 24 and 25. Then her character is spoken of in verse 20. And then again in verse 26. Then her household in verse 21, and then again in verse 27 and 28. Then her person in verse 22, then again in verse 29 through 31. That's the Hebrew poetry there, double alternation, and I'm sure you're glad you learned that this morning. I just thought I'd point that out. Now, there's a big difference. We'll get real practical. Don't worry about it. And when I start getting real practical, some people always say, I wish you'd go back to the Bible study. But uh, there's a big difference between uh, God's description of an ideal woman and the world's God's description. You know, look what God said in verse 30, Proverbs 31, 30. It said, favor is deceitful. You know, some people can show you favor one day and want to kill you the next. That's a deceitful thing. And sometimes when people are showing you favor, it's only to use you. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. Why? It doesn't last. 
It just simply does not. Uh, hey, the most beautiful woman who's ever lived, uh, when she dies and they put her in the ground, I'm not trying to be gross, but the worms are going to get that body. It's going to go back to dust. It fades away. Beauty is vain. And by the way, a woman can be very beautiful outwardly, but so ugly inwardly that you just want to stay away from her altogether. Beauty is vain, but, this is what God said, a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. That's the number one thing about a virtuous woman is she knows the Lord. Because you can't be a virtuous woman that this describes in this passage without God giving you the strength to do it. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And, and the virtuous woman is a wise woman that builds her house. Uh, uh, as it says, I think in Proverbs 9, the wise woman buildeth her house. But it says, a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. And uh, that's very different from the world. You know, the world would say it's all about the looks. And they put all the emphasis on the outward appearance. But you know what Paul said in 1 Timothy 2? He said in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9 and 10, he said, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. He's not saying a woman can't dress up. He's saying a, a godly woman is not known for her apparel. She's known more for her right attitude and actions. He said that she ought to adorn herself in verse 10. He said, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Uh, it's not about the wardrobe, it's about the works. Uh, and, and so he's saying that, you know, you look at God's ideal woman, it's about her character, not just about her outward beauty. But the world says it's all about the outward beauty. There's women that the world celebrates because of what they call models, and yet they have no character. And, uh, and so it's not, what I'm saying is we got to put things in perspective the way from what God says. A Christian woman, what I'm trying to say is this. A Christian woman, she needs to decide that she's going to seek God's praise and not the world's. And she's going to seek her family's praise and not this world. It said that she shall be praised. It said in verse 28 that her, her children will rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. That's the real test, by the way. The real, because you know, who you really are is going to be demonstrated in the home. You can go to church and make people think you're the most godly person in the world, but be a total hypocrite. Your children know that. And if your children arise up and call you blessed, that's the greatest thing right there. That's what you ought to be after. A woman ought to be after God's praise and her family's praise, not the world's. Now, he said in Proverbs 31, verse 10, he said, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Who can find a virtuous woman? Uh, the strange woman is talked about ten times in Proverbs, but the virtuous woman is only alluded to twice in Proverbs. Three times in the whole Bible. And by the way, I won't turn there for time, but if you want an example of a virtuous woman, that would be Ruth. She's called a virtuous woman in Ruth chapter 3 and verse number 11. But uh, very rare. Who can find? Who can find a virtuous woman? It reminds me also of what Proverbs says about a faithful man. It says most men will proclaim to everyone his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find? Hey, especially in the days we're living I mean, it is, it's hard to find a faithful man. It is hard to find a virtuous woman. But they're out there, and thank God for it. And um, we who have been blessed to have a virtuous woman as a wife and, uh, or uh, to have a virtuous woman for a mother, we should thank God every day for her. That's one of the greatest blessings of life. And we ought to thank God every day, and we ought to let her know every day how much we love and how much we appreciate her. Not just once a year on Mother's Day, but constantly. Uh, our, our wives, our mothers ought to feel that respect and that appreciation and that love that's owing to her. And I want to give you just with the time we have left. And by the way, there's only one other reference in Proverbs to the virtuous woman. It says in Proverbs 12 and verse number four, 
it says that a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Women are powerful. They have such an influence. And a woman can make or break a man. No doubt about it. Now, I'm blessed to have a virtuous woman. I really believe that for a wife. And I, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing where I'm at without her. The Lord, all glory goes to God. But as far as my ministry and as far as, uh, hey, without my wife, it wouldn't be there. I mean, if I would have had the wrong kind of wife, I'd be in a mess. But I've got the right kind of wife, and so I'm very blessed. That even rhymed, didn't it? I'm a poet and didn't know it. But my wife... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to stop talking about all that because then I'll get all emotional and everything and I want to get to the rest of this message. But it, I'm so thankful for the virtuous woman that she is to me as a wife, but also to our children, a very godly mother. And, uh, and so that's something it, we, it's so imperative. In fact, let me give you a couple other verses before we go back to Proverbs 31. In Proverbs 18, 22, it says, Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing, amen, <laughs> and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Uh, it's of the Lord to have the right kind of wife. In Proverbs 19, 14, it says about that, it says that a, a gift, that's chapter 20, chapter 19, verse 14, it says, house and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Uh, every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above, from the Father of lights. And uh, James said, with whom there's no variables, neither shadow of turning. And I... I thank God every day for his pure word uh, and for salvation, these great gifts. But I also thank God every day. Every day, honestly, I'm not just saying every day I thank God for my wife and for my mother. And uh, it's so important. It's so important, the, the role that women play in the home and in society. Um, you look at America and what a mess it's in. Look at the condition of the women. I, I'm not trying to be mean, but it's just, uh, boy, it's... If things have changed. Uh, women today, there's a lot of aggressive type women out there, bad women that, and you can just, by the way they talk and the way they dress, you can see they're up to no good. And, and because the women are so far off track, look how far off track the nation is. I'm telling you that women have a strong influence on things. And, uh, you know, the man's the head of the home, but the wife is the neck that turns the head, you know. And, uh, and uh, I, I'm kidding around a little bit, but I, I know, I've, I've, well, I've seen some guys, especially lately, that are clearly henpecked. You know, their wife really runs the house uh, in a real way. Uh, now, I, I'm the head of my home. You can ask my wife, and I'm not just up here saying that, but I, I'm wise enough to listen to her godly uh, input. Uh, and uh, there's something about... Uh, there's so often I, I want to, I'll write a letter to somebody or I'll make a phone call or I have to say, and, I, and I'll run it by her first. Because, see, I, I, am, um, I lack in this area of sensitivity. And so I need a woman's touch sometimes in dealing with people. And she's helped me so many times stay out of a lot of trouble and a lot of good, a lot of good input and wisdom. But uh, let's look. I, I, good night. Where's the time gone? I want to hurry here because, uh, you know, I'm taking my wife out to eat and I'm looking forward to that meal. I always look forward to the meal she makes. But I, uh, I want to take her to where her favorite is. And I hope her favorite is mine also. But but uh, <laughs> Let me give you quickly some marks of a virtuous woman, and I'll give them to you quickly. First of all, from Proverbs 31, first of all, her spirituality. Her spirituality. Notice in verse 1 of Proverbs 31, it said, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. First of all, about a uh, virtuous woman, she's a spiritual woman. Uh, the name Lemuel means dedicated to God. And uh, there's debate about this, but some think that it's actually a name that Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, called him. We won't turn over there for time, but we know in 2 Samuel 12 that when Solomon was born, they named him uh, Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. And uh, he was dedicated. And, and Christian uh, parents ought to dedicate their children to the Lord, no doubt about that, praying that they'll be saved as soon as possible and they'll live for the Lord. But... Uh, we have a good example of what that looks like in 1 Samuel with Hannah dedicating 
Samuel to the Lord. But uh, some say, well, this is not Solomon. But I kind of think it is. Uh, I think Lemuel was one of those names that uh, Solomon's mother called him. And, you know, when we hear the name Bathsheba, we have a tendency to think of her only as an adulterous woman. But, you know, her and David did repent. They did get right with the Lord. And uh, they went on to have Solomon, who became a great king in Israel, and the Lord blessed them. And you know what? Bathsheba, I believe, became a godly woman. Uh, I believe she was a godly woman that sought to train up her son in the ways of the Lord. And I won't read it for time, but in Proverbs 31, verse 2 through 9, she's teaching her son, knowing he's set to be the next king, she's teaching him about the ways of a king and what he ought to do and how he ought to be. And she's clearly a godly woman that wants to see her son walk in the ways of the Lord. And my point on that is this, past sins and mistakes do not disqualify you from ever becoming a virtuous woman. Uh, Bathsheba was not a virtuous woman at one point, but she became one. And any woman that will trust the Lord and serve the Lord, no matter what your past may be like, you can be a virtuous woman by the grace of God. Now, the father is to be the spiritual leader of his home. But a godly mother has such a great influence on her children. Why? Well, for one thing, she's with them a lot more. You know, she's a godly mother usually... Most of the time, not in every case, I understand, but most of the time, the, the, the mother is around the children more than the father. And I'm reminded of what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. He said, uh, he referred to the unfeigned, in other words, the real faith that is in thee. He said, which dwelt first in thy mother and thy grandmother. And Paul told Timothy, from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures. Well, I know that Timothy's father uh, was not, uh, by all indications, as Timothy was growing up, his father was not even a, a saved man, but he had a godly mother and a godly grandmother. And what an important influence that was on Timothy, who became a great leader in the church. And so a woman's not going to become a king, but she could raise one. And a woman's not going to be a pastor, but she could raise one spirituality number one number two her fidelity look in verse 11 and 12 the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil she will do him good and not evil all the days of his life and uh you know in verse 11 there are two key words to a happy marriage heart and trust when you get married you make vows from the heart and what a blessing it is to have a spouse you can trust to always keep those vows. I've never thought one time, we've been married almost 16 years, and never one day did I ever worry that my wife was going to be unfaithful. Because she couldn't find a better man than me. I mean, but uh, that, that's, I'm just seeing if you're listening. I'm just saying, no, but I, I trust her. I, I'm not the trusting type either. I, I'm a very cynical type, sarcastic, uh, negative, pessimistic, hat, the glass is always half empty, the sky is falling type of person. Uh, I'm not a very easily trusting person, but my wife has earned my trust, and I, I'm glad I don't have to wonder if she's going to go be looking for somebody else one day. I, it's a blessing to have that confidence. Notice it says the husband of a virtuous woman has no need of spoil. Uh, that could mean a couple things. It could mean she won't bankrupt him. In other words, he'll not have to go steal to make ends meet. Also, uh, but I can't help but to think about the joke where the, 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 <laughs> the, the guy's uh, credit cards got stolen, and, uh, but uh, he didn't want to report it because he said the thieves are spending less than his wife was. But LAUGHTER <laughs> I'm not a joke-telling preacher, but that's pretty funny if you think about it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, a, a virtuous woman, she's prudent, she's frugal, and she's not going to bankrupt the guy, so he won't have need of spoil. That could also mean he won't, have to, he won't try to go after another man's wife. It could mean that. In Proverbs 6, it says in verse 26, uh, in Proverbs 6, 26, it says, uh, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. 
and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goeth unto his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman, in other words, steals another man's wife, lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. And uh, so that could be in reference to what it says, he'll have no need of spoil. You know, a virtuous woman knows. It says in verse 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. A virtuous woman knows that she was designed by God to be in help meet for her husband. And so she has a desire to submit to his leadership and to be committed to treating him right all of his days. I'm, I, I tell you, I'm a very blessed man. I keep saying it, but I... Uh, you know, I've got it made when it comes to this. And I feel sorry for some of these fellas that have uh, wives that uh, don't take care of them the way that God intended. A help meet for him. It says in the beginning when God instituted marriage. And I just don't, I just do not know what, all, what on earth I would do without my wife. And, uh, uh, and, uh, I hope I'm earning some points. I'm trying hard this morning, you see. <laughs> but, uh, Number three, uh, her industry. Number one, her spirituality. Number two, her fidelity. Look in verse 13 at her industry. See, a, a, a woman's not supposed to be, you know, this idea of a man, dra like a caveman dragging his wife by the hair and all that. No, women are brilliant, uh, and oftentimes they're smarter than men in many cases. And uh, I know because I used to cheat all the time in school off girls' papers. And I didn't care about what the other fellas, I would cheat off the girls' papers. But, but in Proverbs uh, 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 31, verse 13, it says, She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like uh, the merchant's ships that she bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while as yet night and giveth meat to her household and portion to her maiden. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand, she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle and her hands to hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor. Yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings. And by the way, that's the word used for clothing there, coverings. <laughs> a lot of women haven't figured that out these days. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Now, I get tired just reading that. I mean, that's a busy lady <laughs> there. All the stuff that's being said there. You know, a virtuous woman is not a lazy woman. In verse 27, it says, She looketh well the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. A virtuous woman's a hard-working woman. Now, I don't believe it's a sin for a woman to work outside the home. Oftentimes, that's necessary, and that's not wrong. But I tell you what, a woman that takes care of her house has a whole lot to do there. Can you, I, and I can't even fathom a woman who's working full-time outside the home and working in the home. I mean, that's an amazing thing to think about. Uh, you know, ideally, in a perfect world, uh, the, uh, the, the wife and the mother can stay at home all the time. There's so much to do there. And I thank God that for us, my wife, uh, she worked before we were married. But since we started having children, she's never worked since we had our first child uh, outside the home. But she does work a lot in the home. I mean, uh, she works hard. And there's a lot to do there. And, um, you know... It says that she works willingly in this passage. And I'm not going to read all the verses again. I just read them. But you find that she works willingly. Uh, she works sacrificially. She works diligently. She works vigorously. And she even works compassionately. She has a heart for others, not only for her own household, but trying to help the poor and needy. There's a lot that it says there. It reminds me of what Paul told Timothy about helping out widows in the church. He said in 1 Timothy 5, verse 10, he said, let not a, verse 9, let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, 60, having been the wife of one man. He said, this is the kind of widow the church will take care of. Uh, if she doesn't have family to help take care of her, the church can take care of her. But here's the qualification. It said, well reported of for good works. 
if she brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. That's something. Uh, you know, a Christian woman, the good works of a Christian woman are distinct. You know, a Christian woman is not going to go stand out on the street corner and preach necessarily, but she's a witness, of course. She's a witness. But the good works of a Christian mother, you know, sometimes we think of good works as only being in like what we do in the church, but what you do in the home is a ministry. And that's called good works. And if you, do, if you take care of your husband and children as unto the Lord, that's a ministry. God says that's good works. In 1 Timothy 5, 14, he said, I will therefore that younger women marry, bear children. Now listen to this, guide the house. So that's a big responsibility, making sure the house is in order. Now the husband's the leader, but he's not home usually uh, all the time. And so the, the wife there is guiding the house, giving none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And so the works of a virtuous woman. And lastly, her modesty. Verse 23, Proverbs 31, 23. Uh, her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. In other words, it's not occasional that she's kind. It's consistent. It's like a law. A virtuous woman is going to speak with kindness. That, and I'm thankful I have a wife like that. That balances me out, you know, because I, I, I have occasional kindness in my words, and she's, she has continual, so it's a good balance there. That's supposed to be a joke. Um, it says, verse 27, She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Her modesty. She's not a self-promoter. She's not looking for recognition. She's not looking for applause. She... Her works speak for themselves. And her husband and children have nothing but praise for her. And like I said earlier, what your family thinks of you matters a whole lot more than what others think. She doesn't have ambition outside the home to make... In other words, it's not about her being known. She's content with her husband being known in verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates. It's not about her making a name for herself. It's about her family. That's, uh, that's a virtuous woman. Uh, she's known for her attitude and her actions, not her outward apparel. Again, her strength and honor are her clothing. And, you know, it says a lot about that in the New Testament. I'm about to wrap this up, but let me briefly give you 1 Peter 3, where even P Paul says a lot about this too. He talks about um, how that a, a woman... In Titus 2, for an example, he talks about adorning the doctrine of God uh, in, in the sense of living it out in your daily walk. And he said that, the, uh, that the, the elder women need to teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And these characteristics, that's what a virtuous woman's known for. She's not known for her outward apparel. Um, she's known for her, her testimony, her Christian testimony. And Peter says something similar. He said in verse number 3, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which, in the sight of God, which is in the sight of God of great price. See, how she conducts herself, her character, her attitude, her actions. That's what's most important. Not if she's got the latest trend. 
and uh, her husband has no need of spoil. She's not going to bankrupt him at the salon, you know, <laughs> always trying to keep up with the latest styles. It's about her Christian character. And, you know, there's quite a contrast. I mean, if you're blessed with a virtuous woman in your life as a, as a wife, as a mother, boy, I tell you, for an example, in, in Proverbs 21, it says in verse number 9, it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a white house. <laughs> hey, no, I mean, a brawling woman. Uh, thank God if you have a virtuous woman. That's a lot better than a brawling woman. The only thing worse would be a brawling woman as white as a house. That would be even worse because she'd probably take it to you and, and whip you for sure. But in, and, and I know that wasn't very nice, and I apologize. I, uh, just pray for me, you know. In Proverbs 21, 19, it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. In Proverbs 26, it says in verse 21, I mean, Solomon must have had some experience with this. Uh, he said in Proverbs 26, 21, as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Oh, that's actually the man. See, they can even be a problem too. See, I'm trying to balance it out there. But on it goes. I mean, there's a lot of verses like that. Uh, how about this one? In Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. So, look, if you have a woman, a virtuous woman, that she openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness, that's a whole lot better than uh, the nagging, brawling, contentious uh, woman there. So, you know, a lot here in the passage and I'll just close with this statement, that a woman cannot live up to the standard that God sets without the Lord. She needs to, first of all, fear the Lord and know the Lord as her Savior if she's going to be able to live consistently by this standard. And by the way, God has a high standard for all Christians. Uh, Paul said, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Virtue is important. Not just for a woman, but we need to be virtuous as Christians. And the standard that God sets, we can't live up to it but by the grace of God. We've got to know the Lord as our Savior and walk in His power for His glory. And so that's Proverbs 31. Uh, we left a lot out, but that's basically what the passage is about. And thank God for virtuous women. Very rare. Her, her price is far above rubies. You can't put a value. You, you, it's invaluable to have a virtuous woman in your life. Thank the Lord for it. Let's stand together, please. And uh, we're going to be dismissed in just a moment <clears throat> with a word of prayer. But we always like to just pause for a moment before we just...